So we have, we'll move ahead with the next speaker. We have with us Mr. Vijay In the launch of his book last week, The Economics of Killing, and very interesting book that is written on the business and the economics of warfare and several other conflicts which are happening around the world and how it's costing the world and all of us a lot of money. Mr. Vijay Mehta is a philanthropist, a person of Indian origin who settled in the UK along with his daughter Renu Mehta. He runs the Fortune Forum which uh, is trying to bring, a, bring together world leaders, humanitarians, philanthropists, capitalists to see how can we kind of drive the process of change. I'll call upon Mr. Vijay Mehta to come up on stage and he's going to talk to us today about his book, The Economics of Killing and how we need to have inner peace to create global peace. Uh, it's great to be in Delhi and share a platform with distinguished speakers, peace and justice and human rights activists. Your courageous actions, all of you are distinguished in your fields and achievers, and your courageous actions are a driving force for all the changes in the world. For example, the excellent work of Jerry Minu and their iCongo team in pursuit of peace and justice is really outstanding, provides a plat providing a platform uh, for unsung heroes and future leaders of the world. In my talk today, I'm going to explore how can we build a world of genuine peace where weak are safe and the strong are just. Where people can live life without fear, where there is freedom of speech, where there are opportunities, where there are opportunities for realizing your full potential. And that I'm going to go through a process of inner peace leading to global peace. Inner peace, I would put in a very short sentence, is a power. Of course, it's spirituality, it's peace of mind, etc., etc., etc. But I would sh short change it and say it's a power within all of us or all human beings, which can be effectively used or deployed to change the world. A, or a more peaceful place. And along with, I will tie in my talk, nonviolence, which I call a philosophy, a philosophy of life which safeguards us against wars, violence, and all forms of injustices. So that is, I'm going to explore all these areas in my short talk of 10 or 15 minutes. So somebody, some of you, you or someone might say, it's not realistic to talk of permanent peace while fighting continues for at least 18 months in Syria. Iran is under a, a, a threat of an att imminent attack by the US, Israel, etc. And Middle East is volatile as extreme tensions between Israel and its neighbors remain. And let us consider for a minute our own human beings, two billion of whom live on one to two dollar a day, on a daily basis whose basic human needs like food, shelter, education, and health care are denied. And it's a shameful scenario for all of us. And on the other hand, commodity joints like Glencore has just reported a tax of 2.2 billion on the misery of these poor people. 
because they put up the commodity prices. So one can say in times like this, human empathy has become a casualty of culture of war. Let me move on to some of the things which had already explored in an international peace conference in Jaipur last year the obstacles to the attainment of inner peace. I think because I've come from London, I'm getting a special treatment. Uh, um, uh, firstly, let me just, I'm going to throw you some challenges to the audience. Firstly, Will there be an alternative social evolution of our species where we can move towards peace without domination? That someday might eliminate both war and standing armies from our present military mindset. Uh, our first challenge is how can we eliminate both war and standing armies from our present military mindset? or we can demolish the belief in the popular entertainment and culture which takes for granted that violence and war are inevitable and part of human survival. Secondly, is there a way we can have growth without exploitation? In other words, can we be able to clip, clip the wings of this 1% elite whose, I think, crimes are beyond redemption because, they are, because of their greedness and scandals and scams and corruption and whatever you want to call it. What they do is, in short, these corporates or corporations or corporate leaders, they murder torture and steal to satisfy their unlimited material desires. This greed has created economic disparities among racial and ethnic groups and between countries on a global scale. Thirdly, will we be able to combat violent extremism, racial divides, religious intolerances flaring up all parts in India, Egypt, Libya, and many parts of the world. And based on hatred and irrational attachments to their own religions or to religious ideologies. So all these challenges would have thrown have, are lead to in the wider scale culture of violence, which also leads to militarism, military industrial complex. And coming back to what of my talk today, all these are manifestations of imbalance of inner peace. And or you can put it another way, disturbances of mind. Let me speak to the hindrances or weakness to inner peace, which are aptly described in our Indian scriptures. Vedic culture, Bhagavad Gita, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, all of them. They are five, calm, lust, growth, rage, fear, anger, lobe, greed. Lobe will be, I would call, Excesses of capitalism and corporate power. More attachment, obsession and addiction and ahankar, vanity, pride and ego. And these are destroyer of tranquility of mind. In other words, inner peace. And the control of these fives is the key to inner peace. And I would say in in a way, a major contribution of Indian thought to the world. Let me just flag out anger. 
because anger is about confronting the underlying fear, factor of fear. Because all these terror, terrorist uh, groups or acts just come out of fear. Or you can say marginalization of communities, because communities are fearful that they will not get any representation in the main, mainstream uh, society, and the only option they have got is to uh, have terrorist acts. Like, for example, wars in Af Iraq, Afghanistan, and other attacks here. There is a, a attack, terrorist attack, four to six weeks somewhere in the world. In, you, the last one was, was the Sikh temple in Wisconsin, USA. And we have it in India regularly, like the Mumbai one and others. And other violence is, I would say, is gun crimes which is also happening on a regular basis in our civilized society. About 800 million guns are in circulation worldwide. And five and six million are manufactured every year. So, and what's the result? The result is killings, as I said, six temple in Wisconsin. We had 77 people killed in Norway recently in a massacre and etc. And this, the flame of fear, what shall I, shall I call? Violence is also representation of anger and fear. Destroys individuals, engulfs families, ethnic groups, nations, and eventually the whole of humanity. And these are, of, of course, are causes which are like the culture of militarism and reverence of military. These are related to root causes of violence, which is an obstacle to inner peace. In my book, which I've been promoting throughout India, I've just been to Mumbai, Hyderabad, etc., etc., to promote my book, The Economics of Killing. It says, it, the reason, one of the core messages of the book, the world is, getting highly militarized and how can we stop countries militarizing further and further? For example, we in India, do we need to spend, like we did in 2011, 50 billion US dollars on military fighter jets? Who are we going to drop the bombs on? Are we going to fight nationalists and Maoists with fighter jets? On a wider scale, if we see the world military spending, the data from CIPRI, which is Stockholm Peace International Research Institute, the world has spent 1.76 trillion on military last year. While 925 million people go to bed hungry every night. And comparing figures, 4% of this amount of money is enough to wipe out extreme poverty, not just from India, not for the 500 million people in India who cannot read, write, and have got no food, shelter, education. I'm talking of the global uh, world uh, poverty, it can be wiped out, including the financial crisis which is engulfed all European, US, and other countries. And the climate change, which is on our doorstep, and we, have, we know we have to do something about it. My other point to make about this militarization, is, which I've done in the book, how can we as a society be called civilized if it has an international arms or put it another way, killing industry, which leads to wars, violence, barbarism too, and and destroy and counterproductive military budgets. The military budget goes up every year, but nobody ever questions what are the threats, 
why we are spending more this year and the next year i mean the more, biggest disservice has our leaders and the media has done on us is that they have kept a constant the they have kept the threats constant and co uh, on a regular basis the leaders and the media brainwash us that we are not safe in our homes we are not in our society be careful when you send your children to school have a guard on your door have have guards on, in your factory on your house everywhere as if there were queues of terrorists standing all around india trying with the, with guns and killing people it's a highly militarized our society we live in but that's another topic i'm not going to discuss that today the military industrial complex what i was discussing before is the reason for endless wars oppression in developing countries terrorism as i said before let me move on to some alternatives because i have said enough about the damage is done by militarism just let me flag one more out because environment is so important that people don't know military is the biggest user of petroleum in the world and you know how dangerous that is for our environment uh which is go going down the pan of a whole of our planet if we are not careful we may not have a planet for our children or grandchildren at least we should leave the one we are enjoying ourselves and we should work hard for that so how can we be uh get away from this turmoil chaos violence whatever you want to call it a society we have built for ourselves but okay because jerry just remind me three minutes left so let me quickly go to the alternatives which is first of all inner peace is harmony with yourself and surroundings which gautam but said right mindfulness check your mind mahavir said whoever conquers the mind and passion and acts with true austerity shines like a fire in which oblation has been poured so peace starts with our souls and gandhi said also we must become the change we want to see in the world so the alternatives for a peaceful world can be described as as i have described in my 4d for world peace we made a booklet which is the inspiration of my book and also we made a film which some of you have seen is military reduction cut back on global arms trade reforms of our monetary system to what i called a enlightened wisdom based economy that's for another address and addressing the root causes of violence wars terrorism and creating incentives of inner peace leading to global peace in other words we have to get away from the necessity of having a global arms trade arms industry weapons industry etc etc and we have to have a instead of war economy because most of the economies try to uh, live on war we have a peace economy which can be by following the un program for action or culture of peace we can change shift workers from green from war industry into green industry and the 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 benefits the the global uh, uh, it the world can have is according to global peace index if the countries cut back their violence at the rate of 25% for example it could save global economy 2.25 trillion eradicating violence altogether can create a stimulus of 9 9 trillion so you can see there are it's worth it and just give you a few examples and i end like the costa rica a great example who have got no army and nobody has attacked them from 1948 we have our own non violent 
peaceful means in which we achieved our independence. That was a great miracle. And then some of the examples are the civil rights movement in the US, the reunification of Germany, which very ha happened so recently. And then we have the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, peace process. I've been, met me and Shanti have been to Ireland many times to see how the peace process is working and have met the hunger strikers, paramilitary, all that. Let me finish a couple of, uh, uh, one quotation from Martin Luther King, who said, and let me quote, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. So let me say that it has been, let me finish with one quotation of Dalai Lama, who stressed the importance of inner peace in the world. And he said, let me quote, as the question of real peace, lasting world peace concerns human beings. So basic human feelings are also at its roots through inner peace, general world peace can be achieved. In this, the importance of individual responsibility is quite clear. An atmosphere of peace must first be created within ourselves, then gradually expanding to include our families, communities, ultimately the whole world. So taking it, we can take the inner peace to global peace. Thank you very much. the founder, co-founder of Fortune Forum. I shall open the floor for questions to Mr. Mehta. Take center stage. Uh, on your uh, thought process, when I was child, we had the conflicts in our family and they kill each other, 40 people. That what very much disturb people like me because I lost mostly my childhood friends. And uh, that <clears throat> village immersed the biggest mafia in our area. So that pushed to me, leave my medical professions and to start the reconciliations because the problem of the mind of caste which created the, uh, within the family people are fighting. And my reconciliations with the Dalit people and what the created in the last two gangs and um, <clears throat> uh, wanted also the peace because their young generations within the family pushed to them both sides. And recently, three, four years before uh, this process of the reconciliations, what happened, uh, this, this people uh, surrendered themselves. They started to face um, um, a rule of law and uh, there is a most prosperities and more uh, harmonies in the village. So there is a one remark. Second thing, what I learned from the breaking the culture of silence, peace without impunity, peace, peace without justice is the culture of, violence, culture of silence with impunity. Because the, if the talking about the peace without justice is a culture of silence with impunity, what we are doing, many part of the India and also in the world. Thank you, Lennon. Do you want to respond to that, Mr. Mehta? Uh, well, it, it is a comment, so I would just agree with you. So I think people have to do a bit better than that. You can have a comment. Please have a question for me. Yes, yeah. General uh, uh, Segal. May we have the microphone for Mr. General Vinod Segal, please? I'm quoting from a paper I read out in Manila last July. East of India, in Southeast Asia and the periphery near China, the greatest militarization since World War II is taking place. Not counting China, the armaments that are being fed in this region have already crossed 2.5 trillion or in the pipeline. I thought you might like to note that. Yeah, uh, th there is a very frightening trend which have started, which have been highlighted by CIPRI, and I have spoken about it many platforms in Europe and elsewhere, that 
the frightening statistic is that the traditional players who were the big military spenders are still there, like USA, which spent 711 billion, and China 100 billion, and all the European countries, one which I come from, UK, France, Germany, they spend around 60 billion US dollars. But the new trend is that because the countries in Asia have become rich, in 2011, CIPRI statistics, the biggest countries to spend web on weapons are all in Asia, not one, including China, India, and the rest like Korea and others. Uh, it's very frightening in the sense that India, for the first time, have, has the distinction of the biggest arms imported in the world. So it begs the question, if we are having nuclear weapons, are we going to detonate one to kill two million people? Are we going to wipe out countries like Karachi, or sorry, cities like Karachi? Or are Pakistan going to wipe out cities like Delhi or Mumbai? So, so frightening, it's unbelievable. But at the same time, taking the, all that in view, the Asian, Asia is, is, is becoming militarized. So what happens is, when you got guns, they are meant to shoot. So when we have got weapons in part of Asia, the Western countries will make sure Asian countries will fight, as they always make sure in the Middle East. They remember something, it is the military, military generals, and weapon manufacturing companies. I'm talking about the 10 biggest, including Lockheed Martin and Honeywell and, and Raythorn and all, all these companies who manufacture weapons and to continue, continually manufacturing weapons, they make sure there is a fight going on some part of the world. If not, they have they make sure there are rivalries in countries. By only having rivalries and tensions, both the countries are made to buy weapons. So what we call in our, the military balance. So it's such a, such a tragic scenario. That was one of the reasons the, that it, it took me two years to research and write this book. So that, and also it's, it, it's a topic which is a non not a mainstream topic. Have you, uh, seen anyone saying why India is militarizing? No, no leaders talk about it, no member of parliament talk about it, no legislation. So that is one of the reasons we need to work so hard to bring in peace in our world. Yes, we have Stanzen who has a question and we'll come to you, yeah. Uh, I think uh, today we are living in a paradoxical world. We have more advanced and sophisticated uh, weapons of mass destruction, and uh, we have missiles which can go uh, miles and miles and kill, uh, uh, we say enemies, but they are humans, yeah? And uh, in the process over the last couple of decades, we have witnessed that the conflicts and potential of conflict between and within the communities and countries has significantly increased. Uh, government, countries are making investment worth millions, billions, trillions of dollars uh, to create more sophisticated weapons. But on the other hand, if we look at the education system which we have created, the education system is injecting or pumping information to make your mind more clever. It has failed to touch your heart. So what our education system should do is, it should make our heart more compassionate. Even if we look in India, how many universities we have which are promoting peace and conflict resolution. We hardly have few universities which are providing Gandhian and peace education. If you look at those departments, those departments are not having uh, adequate infrastructure, quality faculty, they are struggling for year-to-year -year sur uh, survival. So the government uh, of India across the world need to invest in producing quality human resources who can work and promote peace in the world. So that's what my Thank you, submission yes. is. Thank you. Thank you, Stanson. Yes. Um, 
you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, I just I want to reflect on that. that. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree certainly that education for culture of peace is so important, it's unbelievable. And the only four countries in the world have got ministries of peace, Costa Rica, Solomon Island, and a couple of more countries. Uh, the newly formed country, Sudan. And, but it's so highly important to work for peace because all those problems you mentioned, racial tensions and conflicts within the country is, are, are, are on the basis of that those communities have been marginalized. They have not been able to find opportunities like the mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, com communities, like for a country like ours, 81% is Hindus, but the rest are Christians and Jewish, and, oh, I mean, other communities, they need to have uh, the same kind of opportunity, and Muslims, moreover. And we are the second biggest Muslim country in the world, in population basis. So we have to have the same kind of opportunities for them, what Hindus get, or take it for granted. So unless and until we don't have, we cannot get out of the problems of racial divide, religious divide, and, and people uh, like Nexalites and Maoists, they need to be brought in. They should be here. They shouldn't be uh, terrorists. They shouldn't be throwing bombs. They should be part of, of this Rex here. The reason being, unless and until we don't do it, we have done our work properly. I, as a peace activist, has not been able to do my work properly because all and every part of the community has to be brought into the equation. Like, I, let me give the example of Northern Ireland peace process. For 30 years when I was living in England, a bomb actually fell as near as there, people sitting at the back, at my office, near my office. The whole building shook. And IRA and Sinn Féin, the, 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 who were called terrorists, after 30 years, the UK government said, sorry, we cannot talk to terrorists. But in the end, they sat on the same table. The Irish president, the, uh, the, the UK prime minister, Tony Blair, and the Sinn Féin president, Jerry Adams, and all that, Martin McInnes, and all that. They sat, they thrashed an agreement which is called the Good Friday, Good Friday Agreement, or, or another word is Northern Ireland Peace Process. And once they did, now they're all working in the same constituent assembly and they're working for the peace of Ireland. The, the committed paramilitaries, once, who, who knew nothing else but to murder and kill people, are working for the peace process. And that kind of a process we have to start in our own country. And then we will not have the difficulties what you described. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. We have a question on... We'll take... Two more questions and then five minutes. Please keep it short and brief. We'll have yeah, from both course. sides. Yeah, thank of you. Course. Thank you, sir, for your talk and the, the topic on inner peace. And I really agree uh, with that. To be able to have peace is to start with the inner peace. And my question is, how can we get or have or practice this inner peace we desire? Because we know it's not easy as we're living in this troubled world around us through media that floods us and worry us and give us fear and give us concern. Ourselves, our, our safety, our security, even our children, our family. But uh, like you were saying, those two quotes that you quoted from Martin Luther, Jr. the King, and Dalai Lama about peace, and it reminds me of the, this one quote also from Jesus in the Bible. He said, peace I live with you. Do my file. Yeah, go on, carry on, I'm listening to you. Okay. He said, peace I live with you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. So um, my question is, besides that quote, and how can we get or practice or, um, have 
this inner peace within yeah. us. Thank you. Uh, Thank my, my request to Mr. Mehta is to please keep it brief because we have one more question behind. So Ask just one minute, one, one, one minute reflection on that. Okay, okay. The brief answer is uh, that you uh, you cannot be you you refuse to be influenced if you gear your mind towards it. If the media tells you or media brainwashes you, uh, like we have been uh, brainwashed in India, that there are imminent terrorist attacks. Uh, and, and one more uh, answer is that all leaders in India play the narrative that Pakistan is a dangerous country. When you go to Pakistan, they are more friendlier than some of your Indians we meet here, here in this room or elsewhere. Same, you go to China. China is, as is portrayed in our media as an enemy. And you go to China, wonderful people. You forget about all fear and uh, uh, terrorism, things like that. So it is us who have to train our own mind, because inner peace is spirituality of mind or uh, peace of mind. In other words, you can say inner peace is peace of mind. <laughs> That's all it is. And you have to train yourself to have inner peace and the rest will follow. That's the short answer. Yeah, thank but you so much. So just, just to kind of uh, um, add to that, I think uh, look at Bhutan. They were insulated from the media and that's the reason you see huge happiness in that country. There's case studies happening in the world over gross happiness index. You can actually measure happiness on their faces, on their smiles. But we watch mindless TV which actually touts all the corrupt people like Sharad Pawar and all the armed dealers as eminent people in this country. So when we have such people being touted as eminent people in this country, how can we be insulated and how can we be wise, right? So it depends on how you want to find an inner peace by getting to the truth and getting to the reality and understanding the principle of what is happening in the world. If Arnab Goswami has his way on times now, he would make you believe that everybody in Orissa is a Naxalite. But nobody ever asked the question that why does a Naxalite pick up a gun? Why does a farmer pick up a gun? A farmer does not know anything about killing, but he becomes a killer because he's being marginalized because of corrupt ministers like Sharad Pawar and so many others, the Sibyls of the world, who are actually taking away their rights from them. But nobody talks about it because these are glorified heroes on television. Are we talking against them? No. Yes, Devendra Tak. Yeah, thank you. So I want to ask you, I mean, you know, peace is a wonderful concept and, you know, we all you know, aspire towards it. But if you look at the history of the world in recent times, I mean, the wars between countries are, you know, not really a reality anymore. We talk more about conflict and, you know, internal violence. So, you know, we're not talking about countries spending on uh, ammunition. There are other players in the business who are procuring arms and, you know, and, and spending money on arms. And with the world uh, probably heading towards more depleted resources in the future, we talk about water and you know food. Uh, do you feel that conflict would you know probably increase, and uh, therefore you know would that also you know uh, ultimately result in more arms being bought and sold? Thank you. Thank you, Devendra. It's a quite uh, uh, well. Short answer, sir. One minute. Short, short answer is that what you are describing is already happening because U.S. has put in a reduction, a program of reduction of weapons over next five years or 10 years, something from five to 10 years, for 500 billion. In UK, the country where I reside, the UK government is planning a 8% reduction of armaments. Sometimes you have, shall we say, uh, a crisis, and that can lead to some remarkable results. The crisis I'm referring to is the financial mess and crisis which is engulfed the whole of the world. And it has forced and, and have governments and the others have to rethink how to balance the budgets. If the UK government told all the ministries, international development and defense and foreign and commonwealth and others to cut their budget by 2 billion or 10 billion next year, so they have to find the money. So that way, it has been a blessing. But what we need to do is uh, be careful because on one side, they plan reduction, like in the US, for example. Yes, when, sir. When, when you say 
that 500 10 billion billion is the reduction it is for the redundant weapons already so they are making new weapons so give me uh, okay that's the answer for that give me one minute to quote a couple of things for my ending the presentation yes, sure so let me quote you from different religions for, for how do we have inner peace to world peace and i think in it you will have your answer christianity says blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of god islam says god will guide men to peace if they will heed him he will lead them from the darkness of war to the light of peace buddhism says there is no happiness greater than peace and hinduism says without meditation where is peace without peace where is happiness bahais say war is death while peace is life confucius confucius says seek to be in harmony with all your neighbors live in peace with your brethren and jainism says all sh men should live in peace with their fellows this is the lord's desire and let me finish with the vedas which is considered to be the oldest book on earth may they may there be peace to the heavens peace to the sky peace to the atmosphere may may there be peace on earth and peace in the waters may there be peace to the forests and peace to the mountains may there be peace to the plants animals and to all creatures may we all live in peace thank you very much thank you mr matter Thank you, Mr. Mehta. Thank you okay. once again. So that's your vote, I think. Thank you. Right. So that was Vijay Mehta speaking on inner peace to global peace and from discussing about war and terrorism and conflict which is happening around the world.